before at Flourish and Blotts. Life at the Burrow was as different as possible from life on Privet Drive. The Dursleys liked everything neat and ordered. The Weezes' house burst with the strange and unexpected. What Harry found most unusual about life at Ron's, however, wasn't the talking mirror or the clanking ghoul. It was the fact that everyone there seemed to like him. Mrs. Weasley fussed over the state of his socks and tried to force him to eat fourth helpings at every meal. Mr. Weasley liked Harry to sit next to him at the dinner table so he could bombard him with questions about life with muggles, asking him to explain things like plugs in the postal service. Fascinating. Ingenious, really, said Harry, er, said Arthur when talking to Harry. Harry heard from Hogwarts one Sunday morning about a week after he had arrived at the burrow. Letters from school, said Mr. Weasley, passing Harry and Ron identical envelopes of yellow parchment. Harry... Dumbledore already knows you're here, Harry. Doesn't miss a trick, that man. You two have got him, too, he added, as Fred and George ambled in, still in their pajamas. There was also a list of new books he'd need for the coming year. Second-year students will require The Standard Book of Spells, Grade 2, by Miranda Goshock, Break with the Banshee, by Godoy Lockhart, Holidays with Hags, by Godoy Lockhart, Travels with Trolls, by Godoy Lockhart, Year with the Yeti, by Godoy Lockhart. Fred, you must, you've been told to get all the, Lock, the Lockhart books, too, said Fred. The new defense against the art teacher must be a fan. Bet it's a witch. At this point, Fred caught his mother's eye and quickly buzzied himself with marmalade. That lot won't come cheap. They're really expensive. We'll manage, said Mrs. Weasley. I expect we'll be able to pick a lot of Jenny's things up secondhand. Oh, you're starting at Hogwarts this year? Harry asked Jenny. She nodded, blushing to the roots of her flaming hair. Morning all, said Percy. Lovely day. He sat down in the only remaining chair, but leapt up again almost immediately, pulling from underneath him a molting gray feather duster. At least that's what Harry thought it was, until he saw that it was breathing. Errol, said Ron. Finally, he's got Hermione's answer. I wrote, to him, I wrote to her saying that we were going to try and rescue you from the Dursleys. He carried Errol to a perch just inside the back door and tried to stand him on it. But Errol flopped straight off again, so Ron lay him on the draining board instead, muttering, pathetic. Then he ripped up in Hermione's letter and read it out loud. Dear Ron and Harry, if you're there, I hope everything went all right and that Harry is okay and that you didn't do anything illegal to get him out, Ron, because that would get Harry in trouble too. I've been really worried if Harry is all right. Will you please let me know at once? But perhaps it would be better if you used a different owl because I think another delivery might finish your one off. I'm very busy with schoolwork, of course. We're going to London next Wednesday to buy my new books. Why don't we meet in Diagon Alley? Let me know what's happening as soon as you can. Love from Hermione. <laughs> Well, that fits in nicely, said Mrs. Weasley. What are you all up to today? Harry, Ron, Fred, and George were planning to go up the hill to a small paddock the Weasleys owned. It was surrounded by trees that blocked it from view of the village below, meaning that they could practice Quidditch there, as long as they didn't fly too high. Five minutes later, they were marching up the hill, broomsticks over their shoulders. I don't know how Mom and Dad are going to afford all our school stuff this year, said George. Five sets of books, and Jenny needs new robes and a wand and everything? Harry said nothing. He felt a bit awkward. Stored in an underground vault at Gringotts in London was a small fortune that he, his parents' as lad, had left him. Mrs. Weasley woke all the early the next morning. After a quick half dozen bacon sandwiches each, they pulled on their coats and Mrs. Weasley took a flower pot off the kitchen mantelpiece and peered inside. We're running low, Arthur sighed. We'll have to buy more today. Ah, oh, well, guess first. After you, Harry. Well, what am I supposed to do? He stammered. He's never traveled by flu powder. I'm sorry, Harry, I forgot, said Ron. Never, said Mr. Weasley. Really? We're th How exactly? Not now, Arthur, said Mrs. Weasley. Flu powder's a lot quicker, dear, but goodness me if you've never used it before. He'll be all right, Mom. Harry, watch us first. He took a pinch of glittering powder out of the flower pot, stepped up to the fire, and f threw the powder into the flames. With a roar, Fred stepped right into it and shouted, Diagon Alley! and vanished. You must be clearly, dear, Mrs. Weasley, said, told Harry. He'll be fine, Molly. Don't fuss, said Mr. Weasley. Well, all right. You go after Arthur, said Mrs. Weasley. Now, when you get in the fire, say where you're going. Keep your elbows tucked in and your eyes shut. The suit, don't fidget, said Ron, or you might well fall out of the wrong fireplace. But don't panic and get out too early. Wait till you see Fred and George. Trying hard to bear all this in mind, Harry took a pinch of flu powder and walked to the edge of the fire. He took a deep breath, scattered the powder into the flames. He opened his mouth and immediately swallowed a lot of hot ash. D Diagon Alley, he coughed. It felt as though he was being sucked down a giant drain. He seemed to be fitting, spinning so fast, his bacon sandwiches were churning inside of him. He closed his eyes, wishing it would stop, and then he fell face forward onto the cold stone and felt the bridge of his glasses snap. Dizzy and bruised, covered in soot, he got gingerly to his feet holding his broken glasses up to his eyes. He was quite alone, but where he was, he has no idea. All he could tell was that he was standing in the stone fireplace of what looked like a large, dimly lit wizard shop, but nothing in here was ever likely to be on Hogwarts' list. Even worse, the dark, narrow street Harry could see through the dusty shop window was definitely not Diagon Alley. Harry looked quickly around and spotted a large black cabinet to his left. He shot inside it and pulled the doors closed, leaving a small crack to peer through. Seconds later, a bell clanged, and Draco Malfoy stepped into the shop. 
The man who followed could only be Draco's father. He had the same pale, pointed face and identical cold gray eyes. Mr. Malfoy crossed the shop, looking lazily at the items, told, telling Draco, touch nothing. Malfoy bent down to examine a shell of skulls. Everyone thinks he's so smart. Wonderful Potter with a scar on his broomstick. You've told me at least a dozen times already, said, said Malfoy. A stooping man had appeared from behind the counter, smoothing his greasy hair back from his face. Mr. Malfoy, what a pleasure to see you again, said Mr. Borgen. Delighted. And young Master Malfoy, too. Charmed. I'm not buying today, Mr. Borgen, but selling, said Mr. Malfoy. Selling? The smile faded from Mr. Borgen's face. You've heard, of course, that the Ministry is conducting more raids. I have a few um, items at home that might embarrass me if the Ministry were to call. The Ministry wouldn't presume to trouble you, sir. Surely. Mr. Malfoy's lips curled. I've not been visited yet. The name Malfoy still commands a certain respect. Yet the Ministry grows ever more meddlesome. There are rumors about a new Muggle Protection Act. That Muggle-loving, flea-bitten fool Arthur Weasley is probably behind it. Harry felt a hot surge of anger. As you see... Certain of these potions might make it appear... I understand, sir. Of course, said Mr. Borgen. Let me see. Ah, the hand of glory, said Mr. Borgen, as Draco pointed towards it. Insert a candle and it gives light only to the holder. Best friends of thieves and plunderers. Your son has fine taste. I hope my son will amount to more than a thief or a plunderer, Borgen. No offense, sir. No offense, meant. Though if his grades don't pick up, said Mr. M Malfoy, that may indeed be all he's fit for. It's not my fault, retorted Draco. The teachers all have favorites. That Hermione Granger... I would have thought you'd be ashamed that a girl of no wizard family beat you in every exam, snapped Mr. Malfoy. Ha! said Harry, under his breath. Draco turned away and saw the cabinet right in front of him. He walked forward. He stretched out his hand for the handle. Done! Come, Draco, said Mr. Malfoy. Harry wiped his forehead on his sleeve as Draco turned away. Good day to you, Mr. Borgen. I expect you at the manor tomorrow to pick up the goods. Good day yourself, Mr. Malfoy. If the stories are true, you haven't sold me half of what's hidden in your manor. Muttering darkly, Mr. Borgen appeared into a back room. Harry waited for a minute in case he came back. Then, quiet as he could, slipped out of the cabinet, past the glasses case, and out the shop door. An old wooden street sign hanging over a shop selling poisonous candles told him he was in Nocturne Alley. This didn't help, as Harry had never heard of such a place. He supposed he hadn't spoken clearly enough. There was those mouthful of ashes back in the Weasley's fire. Trying to stay calm, he wondered what to do. "'Not lost, are you, my dear?' said a voice in his ear. An aged witch stood in front of him, holding a tray of what looked like horribly hu whole human fingernails. She leered at him, and Harry backed away. "'I'm fine, thanks,' he said. "'I'm just—' "'Harry, what do you think you're doing down there?' Harry's heart leapt. So did the witch. "'Hagrid!' Harry said. "'I was lost. Flu powder!' "'You're a mess,' said Hagrid, brushing soot off Harry so forcefully he nearly knocked him into a barrel of dragon dung. "'Skullgling out nocturne alley. I don't know. Dodgy place, Harry. Don't want none of you to see her down here.' I realize that, said Harry, ducking his haggard made to brush him off again. I told you I was lost. What were you doing down there anyway? I was uh, looking for a fleshing slug repellent, growled Hagrid. They're ruining the school cabbages. You're not on your own. I'm staying with the Weasleys, but we got separated, Harry explained. I've got to go find them. How come you never wrote back to me, said Hagrid, as Harry jogged alongside him. Harry explained all about Dobby and the Dursleys. Lousy muggles, growled Hagrid. If I'd known. Harry, Harry, over here. Harry looked and saw ha Hermione Granger standing at the top of the white flight steps of Gringotts. She ran down to meet them, her bushy brown hair flying behind her. What happened to your glasses? Oh, hello, Hagrid. Oh, it's wonderful to see you two again. Are you coming into Gringotts, Harry? As soon as I found the Weasleys, said Harry. You won't have long to wait, said Hagrid. Harry and Hermione looked around. Sprinting up the crowded street were Ron, Fred, George, Percy, and Mr. Weasley. Hi, Harry, said Mr. Weasley. We hope you'd only gone one grade too far. He mopped his glistening bald patch. Molly's frantic. She's coming now. Where'd you guys come out? Nocturne Alley, said Haggard grimly. We've never been allowed in, said Ron. I sh right, Ruddy, sure well. Hope not, growled Haggard. Mrs. Weasley came galloping into view, her handbag swing wildly in one hand. Ginny just clinged to the other. Oh, Harry, oh, good dear. You could have been anywhere. Guess who I saw in Borgen and Burks, Harry asked Ron and Hermione as they climbed the Green Gott steps. Malfoy and his father. Did Lucius buy anything, said Mr. Weasley. No, he was selling. Oh, he's worried, said Mr. Weasley. Oh, I'd love to get Lucius Malfoy for something. You be careful, Arthur, said Mrs. Weasley. That family's trouble. Don't go biting up more than you can chew. Meet you back here, Ron said Hermione, as the Weasleys and Harry were led off to their underground vaults by another Green God's Goblin. The vaults were reached by means of small goblin-driven cars that sped along miniature train tracks through the bank's underground tunnels. Harry enjoyed the breakneck journey down to the, down to the vault, but it felt dreadful, far worse than he had in Nocturne Alley. When it was opened, there was a very small pile of silver sickles inside, and just one galleon. Mrs. Weasley fell right into the corners before sweeping the whole lot into her bag. Harry felt even worse when they reached his vault. He tried to block the contents of, from view as he hastily shoved handfuls of coins into a leather bag. 
ba back outside on the marble steps, they all separated. Ron, Harry, and Hermione strolled off along the, win the winding cobbled streets. The bag of gold, silver, and bronze jingled clear carefully in Harry's pocket, w clamoring to be spent. So he bought three ice creams, which they slurped happily as they wandered up the alley, examining the fascinating shop windows. They found Percy deeply immersed in a small and deeply boring book called Prefects Who Gained Power, a study of Hogwarts prefects and their later careers, Ron read aloud off the back. That sounds fascinating. Go away, Percy snapped. Of course, he's very ambitious. He wants to be Minister of Magic, Ron told Harry and Hermione. An hour later, they headed for Flourish and Blotts. They were by no means the only ones making their way to the bookshop. As they approached it, they saw to their surprise a large crowd jostling outside the doors, trying to get in. The reason for this was proclaimed by a large banner stretched across the upper windows. Gilroy Lockhart will be signing copies of his autobiography today until 4.30. We can actually meet him, Harry squeal Hermione squealed. I mean, he's almost written the whole book list. Harry, Ron, and Hermione squeezed inside. A long line wound right to the back of the shop, where Gilroy Lockhart was signing his book. They each grabbed a copy of the standard book of spells, grade two, and sneaked up the line for, to Mr. and Mrs. Granger and the Weasleys. Oh, there you are. Good, said Mrs. Weasley. We'll be able to see him in a minute. Gilroy Lockhart came slowly into view, seated at a table surrounded by large pictures of his own face. Big deal, said Ron, rubbing his foot where the, where the photographer had stepped on it. Gilderoy heard him. He looked up. He saw Ron, and then he saw Harry. <gasps> it can't be Harry Potter! Ladies and gentlemen, he said, laid, loudly waving for quiet. What an extraordinary moment this is. The perfect moment for me to make a little announcement I've been wait sitting on for some time. When young Harry here stepped here in Flourish and Bots, he had no idea that he would surely be getting much, much more than my book, Magical Me. He and his schoolmates will, in fact, be getting the real Magical Me. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure and pride in announcing that this September, I will be taking up the post of Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. The crowd cheered and clapped, and Harry found himself being presented with the entire works of Gilderoy Lockhart. Staggering slightly under the weight, he managed to make his way out of the limelight to the edge of the room, where Ginny was standing next to her new cauldron. You have these, Harry mumbled. I'll buy my own. Bet you love that, didn't you, Potter? It said a voice Harry had no trouble recognizing. Face to face with Draco Malfoy, who was wearing his usual sneer. Famous Harry Potter. Can't even go into a bookshop without making the front page. Leave him alone. He didn't want all that, said Ginny. Potter, you got yourself a girlfriend, drawled Malfoy. Oh, it's you, said Ron. Bet you're surprised to see Harry here, eh? Not a surprise as I am to see you in Shop Weasley, retorted Malfoy. I suppose your parents will go hungry for a month to pay for all those. Well, 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 Arthur Weasley. It was Mr. Malfoy. He stood with his hands on Draco's shoulder, sneering in the same way. Lucius, busy time at the ministry, I hear. All those raids, I hope they're paying you overtime. He reached into Ginny's cauldron and extracted from amid the glossy Lockhart books a very old, very battered copy of A Bigoter's Guide to Transfiguration. Obviously not, said Mr. Malfoy. Dear me, what's the use of being a disgrace to the name of wizard if they don't even pay you well for it? There was a thud of metal as Ginny's cauldron went flying. Mr. Weasley had thrown himself at Mr. Malfoy, knocking him backward into the shelf. Dozens of heavy spell books came thundering down on all their heads. There was a yell of, Get him, Dad! from Fred and George or Weasley. Mrs. Weasley was shrieking, No, Arthur, no! The crowd stampeded backwards, knocking over more shelves over. Gentlemen, please, please, cried the assistant. Break it up, gents, break it up! Hagrid was wading towards them through the sea of books. In an instant, he had pulled Mr. Weasley and Mr. Malfoy apart. Mr. Weasley had a cut lip, and Mr. Malfoy had been hit in the head by an encyclopedia of toadstools. He was still holding Jenny's old transfiguration book. He thrust it at her, and his eyes glittering with malice. Here, girl, take your book. It's the best your father can give you. Pulling himself up out of Hagrid's grip, he beckoned to Drago and swept him up, up the store. You should have ignored him, Arthur, said Hagrid. Rotten to her the core. The whole family. Everyone knows that. No Malfoy is worth listening to her. Bad blood, that's what that is. Come on now, let's get out of here. A fine example to set for your children. Brawling in public. What Gilroy Lockhart must have, must have thought. They said goodbye to the Grangers, who were leaving the pub for the Muggle Street on the other side. Mr. Weasley started to ask them how bus stops worked, but stopped quickly at the look of Mrs. Mrs. Weasley's face. Harry took off his glasses and put them safely in his pocket before helping himself to flu powder. It definitely wasn't his favorite way to travel.